let's begin to uh, understand what are some of the characteristics of sexual addiction. Now, I'll tell you what's going to happen for you. As I crank through some of these, you're going to begin to remember faces and names and stories. And uh, before we even start, let me just uh, encourage you about one thing, and that would be, if you're like me, you're going to hear some of this stuff, you're going to get educated, and, and you're going to maybe, some of you who've done counseling or been pastors or are pastors, you're going to feel a little bit guilty, like, gee, I missed it. <laughs> you know, I, I'm sorry. I, you know, I know that in my early days of getting trained in this field, I had a temptation all the time to do what uh, I call the recall. You may have a temptation to have a recall. Uh, would you come back? Is, you know, I missed some things. You know, I would just uh, encourage you that your education about this is all in God's timing. God's timing is perfect. So wherever you're at today and, and understanding this, I, I would just uh, ask you not to beat yourself up. You know, the fact that you're watching this, that you're seeking to get trained, you know, congratulations. That's a very wonderful and powerful thing. And I hope that what you're going to be learning throughout this series will help you minister to the body of Christ in the future. So, on the screen, as I talk about uh, various of these characteristics of sexual addiction, you will, will see them appear, and uh, they will also be in your teaching notes. The first characteristic that we talk about with sexual addiction is uh, this kind of powerful word. We say it is unmanageable. You'll know, some of you who know the 12-step tradition, the first step of Alcoholics Anonymous is, I admitted that I was powerless over alcohol and that my life had become unmanageable. Well, I just want to pause for a moment and talk a little bit about unmanageability because I think sometimes uh, in the Christian community we get a little uh, hung up about this because sometimes we think for an addict to say that their disease is unmanageable, uh, it's a cop-out. In other words, we say, I'm out of control. I have no control. And I know many of us Christians, we, we, we certainly think that a person has an ability to decide about whether or not they follow Christ and obey God's commandments. So we get a little hung up once in a while saying that this is a moral problem with addiction, that addicts truly have the ability to decide to be sober. So how can we call this unmanageable? Well, I think we can call it unmanageable because it's really a form. Addiction, in its essence, of any kind, is a form of original sin. Now, let me try to explain that. First of all, just go back to the Garden of Eden and your understanding of what Adam and Eve sin was. Basically, God told them that he would provide for all their needs. In this garden, a perfect place, he would take care of everything they wanted. He would answer all of their desires. There was only one exception, and that is this one particular tree that was kind of a tree whose fruit was knowledge, and he, he instructed them not to eat from that. So in other words, you know, he said to Adam and Eve, I'll take care of everything, just obey my commandments, don't do that one thing. Think about that with addiction. I mean, a lot of the things that we're talking about, certainly in this series, are normal biological things like sexuality or uh, we could talk about eating disorder at some other point or whatever it is. I mean, these things are normal human desires. And God says, you know, I'm going to take care of all your needs. And somewhere in our heart and in our spirit, we say, you know, I don't trust that. And that's certainly the case with Adam and Eve. They said, I don't trust that God's going to do this. I need a little of this knowledge for myself. So they, of course, took the bite of that fruit, and the rest is literally history. Well, we are inheritors, as we believe in our faith, of that original sin. And what that original sin is about is the failure to trust God, to take care of all of our needs. That, in essence, is in fact addiction. God says, I'll take care of all your heart's desires. I'll take care of whatever you need for a relationship and everything else. And an addict comes along and says, I don't trust that. So in effect, what I'm trying to say is that an addict is a person who has not been able in their life to truly surrender their life to the control of God. 
So I think when we say it's an addiction and it's unmanageable, it's unmanageable because there hasn't been a total heart surrender. And until that happens, until a person really is in a committed relationship with Christ, working on that every day for the rest of their life, these sexual temptations and things are going to come along and basically hijack the mind of an addict and it's going to feel to them that they are totally out of control. It's basically like what Paul throughout the New Testament talks about as being kind of double-minded. In Romans 7.15 he says, the good that I would, I don't do. The evil that I hate, that is what I do. If that was true for Paul, as he is also an inheritor of original sin, he's basically describing to us, even as Christians, there are many, many times when there are good things we want to do that we don't do. There are evil things that we hate that we go ahead and do. That is the constant struggle that we're all in every day, to do the right thing and avoid the wrong thing. And I think every addict that I've ever known, every sexual addict that I've ever treated or dealt with, they have basically two parts of themselves. There's a part that wants to follow God, be spiritual, know Christ, get into a more dependent relationship with Christ. There's that part. But there's that other part of them that has been using addiction for years and years and years in their life to cope, to survive, to get their needs met. And, and many, many days in their active addiction, they're struggling to be the man God calls them to be or to kind of give in to their addictive behaviors because that's how they've survived. And in many days, it's, it's a balancing act. James, the brother of Christ, talks about in his letter in the first chapter, we are those double-minded people. We're going back and forth. That's basically, I think, a picture of unmanageability. We feel out of control. We feel hijacked. We feel like it's an impulse. We feel like we're on automatic pilot. I mean, I've known so many addicts who they basically, in their mind, kind of dissociate. They, they feel like they're just going to do this come whatever may happen. And, and at, at, at that point, they feel like their body, their mind, their lust, uh, their craziness has just taken over. You know, this can get incredibly out of control. I mean, throughout this series, we'll obviously tell stories. One of my stories that, that I was told by an ophthalmologist after the very first time I ever lectured on sexual addiction, it was down in Atlanta in 1988. And after this speech in which I was trying to describe sexual addiction, uh, an ophthalmologist came up to me and he said, I'll tell you a story of unmanageability. I said, why would an ophthalmologist be telling me a story of un uh, unmanageability? An, an eye doctor? I don't get that. Well, you will when you hear this story because he said he basically had treated a patient who had plucked out both of his eyes. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's the, was he thinking about the Bible there where Jesus said, if your eye offends you, pluck it out? And this, this doctor said, absolutely. Well, how did his eye offended him? Well, he had been hooked into pornography. So in other words, here was a man who was a Christian. He was reading scripture. He was wanting to follow Christ, wanting to give up pornography, but at some level of his spirit, he felt like it was just totally out of control. The only thing he could think of to do in his pathology, in his disease, was to literally take the biblical injunction that seriously. Now, I could tell you stories and stories and stories of addicts that have lost their lives due to sexually transmitted disease lost their marriages, lost their jobs. Right now, one of the great sadnesses in our practice is every time we see a person who's been fired from their job for internet addiction. This is seemingly on the surface an unmanageable problem. But again, remember the double-minded nature of all addicts. And remember the fact that this is original sin. And remember the fact that until an addict learns how to, on a daily basis, truly surrender their life to Christ, you know, there's not going to be healing and recovery. The second point is that addiction, for it to be an addiction, must create what we call neurochemical tolerance. For something to be considered an addiction, it has to create neurochemical tolerance. Now basically, that's a phenomenon in the brain, as, as many of you, I'm sure, already know, where the brain is going to adjust to whatever you put into the brain, and when it makes that adjustment, it's going to need more of that chemical to achieve the same effect. Now, 
for alcoholics, when you drink alcohol in any of its varieties, you take that into yourself, it gets converted into things that, that bathe your brain with various kinds of neurochemistries, and your brain adjusts. So if in the beginning days of your drinking, drinking one beer makes you drunk, after a few weeks or months of this, one beer isn't going to make you drunk anymore. You're going to need another beer. And of course, all of us know people who have gotten so ramped up in this that they're drinking cases of beer, fifths of uh, whiskey, you know, incredible amounts of, of alcohol just to achieve the same effect that they would have had years before by having a small amount of that substance. We could talk about heroin, cocaine, any of the other drugs that are being abused out there in our culture today. We could talk about prescription medications. We could talk about nicotine. We could talk about caffeine. We could talk about any of the kind of things we take inside of ourselves that create neurochemistry. When that happens, the brain is going to adjust. You know, we're talking about one thing here that God has put into our brains, which is an incredible ability to adjust to some of the filth that we put into it. And God has said, I want you to live and I want you to prosper and I'm going to create in your entire body the ability to adjust to whatever you do to the body. But after a while, that ability to adjust kind of gets broken down and, and tired. Well, that's the phenomenon, though, of tolerance and you need to kind of begin to think about that when it comes to sexual addiction. Because for it to be an addiction, according to the medical world, it has to be able to create tolerance. As we'll see in this series, there are pioneering people that are coming uh, down the road here who are beginning to actually look at the human brain. I've been involved in a number of research studies uh, uh, at Vanderbilt and other places using functional MRI studies of the brain to actually see what the brain does when we think about sex, look at sex, or engage in sex. We know that when you even just fantasize about sex, there are powerful neurochemical uh, 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 hormones and other things released in the brain. So if you understand that, in other words, the brain controls everything we do. There is a sexual center of the brain where the human sexual response is. God said, be fruitful and multiply. You know he's going to put the desire in our brain to have sex, to be sexual. It's a normal part of the human condition. If the brain controls everything we do and the brain does everything it does based on neurochemicals being trans knitted back and forth between the, the ends of the nerves, then you know that there's powerful stuff going on in the brain when we think about sex or engage in sexual activity. So we're going to get more into that in a later segment of this series. But for now, just please understand when you fantasize about sex, when you uh, engage in sex, even if it's only masturbation, and you have an uh, orgasmic release, there are there are chemicals at both ends of that spectrum that are being released in your brain. The pursuit of sex and fantasy or engaging or trying to obtain it in whatever way, that creates powerful chemicals like dopamine, for example, that takes our mood up and we get excited. Sometimes when we're pursuing sex, it's new, it's exciting, adrenaline gets produced, adrenaline elevates dopamine. I mean, there are powerful things going on in the brain just when we think and think about and pursue sex. Now, at the end of that response, when we actually have an orgasm, you know, all of us, all of you watching probably know about the incredible uh, relaxation effect of that. Well, there are many neurochemicals released in the brain called catecholamines. These chemicals have an ability to relax us. They are, they are morphine and heroin-like in their effect, and they give us an intense sense of pleasure. Well, as you recognize those responses in your own brain, just think about the fact that if you're masturbating once, twice, or more a day, if you're engaging in sex on a very frequent basis, if you're fantasizing about all kinds of things, this is going to be releasing lots of neurochemicals in your brain. Your brain is going to adjust, and it's going to need more of those neurochemicals to achieve the same effect. There is no doubt in my mind that sexual addiction is a form of drug addiction. The drugs are produced in our own human brain. Now that makes recovery from sexual addiction especially challenging, don't you think? Because we don't need to go out to a liquor store or a bar or buy it on the street to get our supply. 
All we need to do is maybe turn on our television set or click into the internet or click into our memories because there's lots of stuff that, have, that has been stored there. So we're going to have to really do what Paul talks to us about in Romans 12 too, and that is we're going to need to be transformational in terms of the mind. Number three, because of this factor of tolerance, uh, we're going to need more of the same to achieve the same effect. That's what leads us to say that for something to be an addiction, it has to create a progression. It has to get worse over time. Now, as you heard my story, it started out stealing a magazine once a month, started masturbating later once a month. You know, over the years, the frequency of looking at pornography, the frequency of masturbation, the frequency of any other activities may increase. Now, one of the things to think about there and be aware of is that in my story, you can go basically between age 11 and age 37 and see a 25 year progression of how it got worse over time. Now in that, there were periods where I gave certain of those activities up for months, maybe even a year or two in some cases, but I would always return to it eventually. And that is the case with almost every addict I've known. They've been able to give it up for a while just to return to it, or they've been able to give up certain parts of it for a while while they were maintaining other things. And they will eventually always come back. So that as you're taking a history with a person, you will be sure, hopefully, to get a, a full range picture of their entire life so that you can kind of assess point A to point B. Now, one kind of side note here, and that is as you're looking at this, we are in the middle of a crisis in our culture, and that crisis is being created by the internet, and the internet is, is bombarding us with so many different sexually pornographic websites that basically what has been happening over the last five to 10 years is that the time at which it takes an addict to ramp into an addiction has dramatically shortened. The internet has the ability to suck people in like nothing I've ever seen before. Back when I was 11, you had to wait 30 days to get your next sort of source of supply. Today, in an hour's time, you can visit over 100 websites that have all kinds of incredible things on them. And you can basically see that as our culture has ramped itself up, so has the speed at which many of us can get tolerant and get more addicted all the time. I, I want to tell you one of my favorite stories, and that's the story of a, a pastor's wife, actually, who, the reason it's my favorite story is because this woman is actually uh, a very lovely lady who's now in recovery and doing well. But she was given a computer by her husband for Christmas. And in the month of January, she began experimenting with the internet, and she thought it would be fun in her loneliness to just have some talk on the internet in one of these chat rooms. Well, in the month of January, that led her to meet people, men, all over the country. She told us much later, of course, that she doesn't remember the month of January. She was on the computer all day long. By February, two months later, she was having affairs with three men in person in three different states that she had met on the internet. Now you see there's a two month escalation. That's how fast sometimes the internet can suck us in to its power. But for now the point is when you take a history you're going to be able to go from not doing any of this to gradual sometimes maybe more rapid escalation there'll always be a pattern of increasing activity of some kind now be careful it doesn't necessarily always mean doesn't usually mean that you're going to graduate from one kind of sexual activity to more difficult sexual activities it may simply mean that you do that that kind of activity more often i mean the classic case would be pornography and masturbation if you do that once a month over time, you're going to wind up doing it once a day or more. 
And I'm not going to get into a lot of cases now, but I've certainly seen individuals who have engaged in pornography for hours and hours and hours every day, masturbated multiple times every day, and that's how serious this can get, even if it only remains a pornography and masturbation problem at that point. Number four, as we're talking about these crazy, awful things, you can imagine that there are destructive and negative consequences. There are all kind of physical consequences, medical consequences. You know, the, the possibility of uh, STDs, sexually transmitted diseases, is incredible and amazing. Uh, there are lots of people who have lost sexual functioning due to that. There are people who have lost their lives due to that. I think one of the uh, very sad statistics that we're all learning about in these days when we're uh, making uh, this series is that about one-third of the population of the subcontinent of Africa is dying of AIDS. I mean, one-third of the population, and how did this get started? Well, it got started with the, the promiscuity, the prostitution, the kinds of rampant sexuality that was being practiced uh, due to the poverty and conditions in the subcontinent of uh, South Africa. Well, you know, that's just one example of some of the medical consequences, the physical consequences. There are a variety of other things we could talk about. There are people who present themselves to the doctor who are sexually sinning. They're not talking about that. They're talking about the stomach aches, the headaches, the back aches, the variety of other physical symptoms that they had. I mean, basically, to, to do these behaviors and try to cover them up is an incredibly stressful thing, and it's going to lead to potentially all kinds of medical problems in your body. The legal consequences, uh, right now I'm treating about five or six men who've gotten out of jail for having done various kinds of sexually offending behaviors. They now, for the rest of their lives, are going to be marked in our culture as a sexual offender. Three of them now simply just cannot find a job to support their families, and it's an incredibly sad thing. Uh, that's the legal consequence of a sexual offense, but there are obviously other kinds of legal consequences. Arrested uh, for soliciting prostitution, uh, indecent public exposure, people who are having to get themselves embarrassed in the paper because of these kinds of uh, behaviors. There are people who are getting sued. Uh, I know that was the case in my story. Later on, after I got in recovery, there were several lawsuits that were part of uh, my consequences and, and uh, my recovery journey. Well, you know, there are those kind of devastating legal things that can happen. Uh, there are social consequences. You lose friendships. People don't want to talk to you anymore. Uh, you lose relationships at the, at the highest, most intimate level. You may even have the family part of that, and there's a certain percentage of sex addicts who will wind up divorced if both husband and wife don't get treated. The kids and the devastating effect of divorce on uh, children is profound. Well, I don't know. I, I don't want to get just into a litany of all the consequences, but you know in your heart, and as you've experienced this in some of your own parishioners and clients, you know, this is a devastating problem. Uh, basically, Dr. Patrick Carnes has said that sexual addiction and all of its various consequences are the number one health concern of our current world culture. The next point is that because of the neurochemical effect of sexual addiction, you know, with the high, the dopamine, the adrenaline, the various kinds of things that happen in the brain, we can use sexual fantasy and activity to alter or change the way we feel. And the way we, we put that point is sexual addiction can be used to escape your feelings. So if you're depressed or stressed or sad or lonely or angry, you know, doing these sexual things may be a way that you try to cope and survive uh, what you're experiencing. So one of the ways to look at sexual addiction for some is that it's a stress management strategy. For some, it's an anger management strategy. For many, including myself, it's an anxiety management strategy. Are you worry about things, you're coping with something, you have all kinds of anxiety, you think about something pleasurable, engage in the various forms of sexuality, that, that takes your mood to a different place. You have the high of being orgasmic. That brings all that intense heroin-like stuff. You can see where, as we're beginning to understand the neurochemistry, you know, whatever you're feeling, you can change it through your own self-manipulation. One of the things we say about sex addicts is that they seek to be pharmacologists of their own brain. Well, that's any addiction, really, whether it's alcohol, cocaine, eating, even working. 
basically when we engage in that activity, we're seeking to change the way we feel. The next point is uh, difficult because I don't like it. It makes me feel some sense of shame today, but it's called entitlement. One of the things I would encourage you to think about with any of the people you're working with is just get in a conversation with them in your counseling experience. You know, what is it that allowed you to justify doing this? I have all the men that I work with write out for me, remembering back to their last uh, sexually sinful experience. I said, write out to me a letter, and I want you to start the letter this way. Dear God, this is the reason why it was okay for me to sexually sin. And then just leave them with that assignment and say, I want you to just be open to your mind and your heart and ask yourself, how did you justify, rationalize, minimize, deny the incredible power, significance, sinful nature of what you were about to do. <laughs> By the way, you know, I have a backhanded agenda with that assignment. It's like the next time they think about sexually sinning and their recovery, they're going to have to think about, dear God, why is it okay for me to go ahead and do this? Well, you know, it's a hard question for me because, you know, in many of the years of my active sexual addiction, I was not only a Christian, I was an ordained minister, and I was a PhD level therapist. So, you know, Ministers, Christians, therapists, you know, how do you justify all this crazy behavior? Well, one of the factors that I used is the factor of entitlement. It's basically a long, age-old anger that many addicts have in them. No one loves them. No one likes them. No one takes care of their needs. They're taking care of everybody else, and they deserve to get some of their needs met. As a pastor, I'm thinking, you know, I'm serving everybody else. The week that I was intervened on, I had 43 counseling hours scheduled. I was serving on the school board. I was preaching at a church on Sunday. We had three kids. I was teaching at the local Christian college. You know, basically, I was also into a workaholism, and I was escaping lots of things by being incredibly busy. But it did allow me to say, you know, gee, I'm doing all these things for other people. Maybe God will not mind that much that I'm masturbating or looking at pornography or whatever else I was doing. You know, there's this sense of entitlement. I deserve for this to happen. There are a whole lot of people who say they're Christians, act and behave like Christians in many ways, but are angry at God, haven't truly surrendered their life to Christ. And by that, I'm not trying to be judgmental. I'm just saying they've had a hard time really letting go, really submitting, because there's a part of their spirit that said, if God was a loving God, he wouldn't let me do these things or wouldn't have let these things happen to me. He'd be taking care of my needs. He wouldn't have put me in this marriage that I'm in. You know, that's another one, obviously, in this entitlement thing. My wife, if she were truly a godly woman, submitting like it talks about in Ephesians 5 or whatever it is, you know, I wouldn't be struggling with this kind of, this kind of issue. The next one is it's used as a reward. Well, if you're entitled, if you deserve something, if you've rationalized it, denied it somehow, gotten past your religious defenses, you know, you're using this as a reward. I'm doing something nice to myself by engaging in this activity. I'm the only one doing it. No one else cares about me. No one else loves me. I'm a bad and worthless person, so I'm going to do this, and this is my reward. The final point in this uh, list of uh, the definition of sexual addiction is that for an addict, to engage in these sexual behaviors, it gives them a feeling of being powerful. An addict has this need inside to find affirmation, love, nurture, caring, uh, blessing, praise, and they, they are thinking that the way they get it is to manipulate other people. And there's nothing quite like trying to manipulate other people into sex that gives them a sense of power. Now, it doesn't have to be other people. You know, we have a number of men in our practice right now, for example, who are not being sexual with their, their spouses, but they are being sexual with themselves and being sexual by looking at images and pornography primarily on the Internet. Now, think about that. If you engage in sex in a normal, intimate relationship with your spouse, that requires you to have a relationship. You might be out of control in that. You might not have as much power as you'd like to have. You know, with the internet or with a magazine or with a video or with whatever it is, you're the one that controls whether or not you look at it or so you think. You're the one that opens the pages, plops in the video, turns on the computer or the internet. You think you have power. So in other words, a lot of the sexual behaviors that we're talking about, the person, the addict, thinks they're in control, thinks they have power, 
They're being powerful over images. They're being powerful over themselves. They're being powerful over their relationships. Maybe even in terms of manipulating marital sexuality, they feel like they're being powerful over their own spouses. So, you know, this kind of would segue us back to point one. This is an original sin problem. I mean, an addict thinks, I am real power, really powerful. One of the ways that uh, Dr. Patrick Kearns put it is that all addicts think they're masters of the universe. You know, is that not sounding a lot like original sin to you? Well, that's a, that's a list of some of the characteristics. We're going to get into some more specific things here next, but those are the basic foundational things to think about when you're talking to anyone you're trying to assess for sexual addiction.